I should start the presentation with um, both a thanks and an apology. Uh, thanks to Vodafone uh, for supporting our event and an apology that um, uh, regrettably we were unable to um, have someone from Vodafone to speak today. But what we've done is that Vodafone and myself have collaborated to form this presentation uh, that I'm about to give you now. And really, this is the starting point. How did all of this begin? And um, actually, let's go back to 1947, uh, not quite 30 years ago, a little bit longer than that. And particularly, the work at the Bell Telephone Laboratories in America, um, led up by, and what a name to work in telephony, Douglas Ring. You know, he couldn't have gone into any other profession, could he, with a, with a name like that. Uh, and William Young, who on um, the uh, 11th of December 1947 wrote this document, Mobile Telephony Wide Area Coverage, where they set out all of the principles of what we would now recognise as a cellular mobile phone network. The problem they faced was that the technology of the day was simply not capable of delivering the vision. And as a consequence of that, an alternative mobile system evolved in America, uh, the personal mobile radio system or the private mobile radio system. And they developed in this country as well, particularly in police forces and the utility industries. But until the launch of a public radio phone service, those systems could not be connected to the national telephone network. However, on the 28th of October 1959, in this part of the UK, the South Lancashire Radio Phone Service opened, and that now did allow people to have a telephone in their car and were able to make and receive telephone calls onto the national network. That, of course, was extended into London with the opening of the Post Office Tower, which next month will celebrate its 50th birthday. Um, so we got this national radio phone service, but that's not a cellular system and there are a lot of weaknesses and restrictions with a radio phone service, which really would mean a scalability would not be achievable. So as technology, the electronics improved, so the concepts that were first put down in 1947 could become a reality. And on the 3rd of April 1973, the team at Motorola, led by Dr. Martin Cooper, actually demonstrated a working cell phone. Now, the photograph here, of course, is um, the phone is original. Uh, <laughs> this is 40 years after that event, so uh, Martin Cooper is a little bit older in the photograph, but of course he was celebrating the 40th anniversary when this was taken. This now demonstrates that the concepts of cellular and the advantages of cellular can be realised in technology. And so now we reach the point where cellular telephony is able to take over from radio phone services. The UK government in 1982, and the UK was by no means the first country to go cellular, announced that there would be two licences awarded for the provision of cellular services in the UK. The requirement was that those services had to start by the 31st of March 1985 and cover 90% of the UK population by the 31st of December 1989. One of those licences would go to BT, who with Securicor formed Telecom Securicor Cellular Radio Limited and they branded their network Cellnet. The other was open to competition and was eventually awarded to Raycal, who created Vodafone. So these were the two UK licences that would go forward. The system adopted for both of these, and they had to be interworkable, was based on what was going on in America, and a derivative of the American system called Total Access Communication Systems, or TACS, was introduced for these two networks, operating on around the 900 megahertz uh, frequency, offering 600 voice channels analogue on that network capacity. And that spectrum was obviously shared across these two operators. And so the story moves on from there to the 1st of January 1985 and the year it all began. And um, this person, who I'll introduce shortly, uh, is uh, played an important part in this. Of course, we didn't have a cellular system in the UK. Um, we had a radio phone service. And so 
how do you sell a concept which doesn't yet exist? And Vodafone and Cellnet, of course, face this challenge. How do you actually start selling this new concept of mobile phones? And Vodafone created a 20-strong sales force to do that. I hesitate to know how big a sales force they have today. I suspect a lot more than 20. Um, but that just goes to show what's been achieved in, in 30 years. Um, it was all about young professionals and finance, law, business and medicine. And of course, you had to be in those professions because we're talking about the thick end of £3,000 for a handset, a connection charge, a monthly fee, and then call charges on top of that. Um, of course, the mobile phone, uh, now this particular era, if you see a picture of a brick phone of which we've got out in the exhibition, it screams 1980s to you. Uh, and obviously the, f the feature film Wall Street with Michael Douglas and so on uh, is remembered as much for the cell phone he was using uh, as anything else. Vodafone actually celebrated their 30th anniversary uh, and they brought together an event in London and I was privileged to be invited to be part of that. Um, and here we have uh, Ivan Don reunited with who Vodafone claimed was their first customer, Mungo Park. Uh, and he's, he's probably querying his bill in this photograph of 30 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> he's probably saying, I didn't really make that call. Um, but Vodafone really did um, do quite a lot of effort to promote their 30th anniversary, and by so doing, 30 year anniversary of the UK mobile phone story. So it has come an awful long way, but the question that everybody wants to know is, OK, then, who made the first phone call? If you read the press and the media, it's the person on the left, comedian Ernie Wise. But Vodafone revealed in their event held in December that it was the guy on the right who actually did it, and that's Michael Harrison, um, son of Sir Ernest Harrison, who was the first chief exec of Vodafone. And he actually, there was a family party celebrating New Year's Eve, and he snuck out of that party, was taken to Parliament Square in London, where he then f telephoned his father, Sir Ernest, on a Vodafone cell phone uh, and said, Hi, Dad, it's Mike. Uh, this is the first ever call made on the Vodafone network. Well, of course, there are lots of engineers in the room who will say, Oh, no, it wasn't. We were doing test calls on that network weeks before he did this. Um, well, given that it was an official launch on the 1st of January, technically, he's the first one post the launch. So with engineers in the room, we have to be a bit pedantic, don't we, about what we mean by first. Later uh, that day, Ernie Wise, of course, came into St Catherine's Docks in London and publicly inaugurated the Vodafone network. Uh, he arrived on a horse-drawn Royal Mail coach uh, and then proceeded to make uh, a, a phone call uh, to Sir Ernest in the Newbury headquarters of Vodafone. And that's what's captured and recorded in the annals of history. Very little actually exists of that momentous time. Very little photographic record of it. And um, a question that has bugged me for ages is, well, OK, what phone did he use? And I have to say that it's an easy question to ask and quite a hard question to answer, or it's proved quite hard. So let's look at the evidence. Here's one of the few photographs, I'm aware of about three photographs of Ernie Wise inaugurating the call. This is one of them. Let's look at that handset, look at the shape. of the, it's, it's investigative journalism, this. Let's look at that shape. Ask yourself the question, what is she holding? Because there's a piece of wire <laughs> going from Ernie Wise into the Royal Mail coach. Something afoot here, perhaps. <laughs> What is going on? Well, the answer to this question uh, has now been answered. And the answer is, it was a car phone that was used, a Panasonic VM1, car phone unit. Uh, there were basically three types of mobile phone, a car installation, a transportable, and then the hand portable. And in fact, in these early days of Vodafone, it was the Panasonic VM1 car phone, which was available for launch. And that is what Ernie Wise is using. If you compare the handsets, it's unmistakably the same handset. 
If you look at what the lady's holding, that cable is the link from the handset to the base unit, of course. It was a cellular call. It wasn't faked. A genuine cellular call, but we now know it was a Panasonic VM1. Uh, and Mike Pinchers is also from Vodafone, has separately confirmed that with an email correspondence uh, with Andy. So at last, my question is answered. And you know, it was such a momentous day that the newspapers went absolutely crazy. Uh, the Times covered it on page two. That's how important it was. Uh, you can see how many column inches they gave. The Financial Guardian waited till the 3rd of January to uh, make some comment about it, and they reserved space on page 15. Now, every new iPhone that's launched is a global media event. 30 years ago, they barely got any column inches in reputable national newspapers. The rest, though, from that 30-year history is really, sorry, from that 30-year point is really history. And Vodafone is the one company from launch that still exists in its original form, Vodafone. The name has stuck all the way through that 30-year history. All the other companies have gone through some sort of transformation in ownership, in branding, evolution. And of course, we've had new entrants join the UK networks over that 30-year um, period. So what has actually happened? Well, by April 1987, Vodafone had over 80,000 customers. And even at the start and the launch, they, they were really feeling that sort of figures of 20,000 customers was a bit optimistic and clearly um, things grew quite dramatically. So in 1989, Vodafone hits um, 500,000 and starting to expand quite rapidly. Um, international roaming um, comes on in 1991. Um, the first text message. Now we do have out there in the exhibition, the model of mobile phone that was used by Neil Papworth, um, sending a text message to Richard Jarvis. Now, you have to remember that with that first text message, the mobile phone could only receive text, it could not transmit. So Neil Papworth actually sent the world's first text message from a computer. But the Orbital 901, the model of phone that was used to receive that text message on the Vodafone network, is out there in the exhibition for you to have a look at it. And you just think now, 1992, just think of what happened to the text message story uh, since then. The mobile phone very much gone from a luxury item into an everyday commodity that people would often feel they can't live without. Just before the turn of the uh, millennium, Vodafone reaches 5 million customers um, 15 years after um, the original launch. Prepay is an important, you know, going to think about mobile phones in terms of the customers and creating packages which would allow the phone to be sold and customers to follow to the network. 3G comes in on the Vodafone network across Europe in 2004. So rapidly in the 2000s, you're seeing dramatic advances in the technology, in the coverage of the networks, and of course, in the number of operators out there. 2009, 300 million customers global. Vodafone's become a, a global brand, of course, as many of the operators have. So we've gone from one of the first two licenses offered to the UK mobile networks to companies which are genuinely global brands. The mobile phone has really evolved into an essential everyday item. It started with models like these. Um, the uh, VM1, the VT1, so you've got on the left there, the top left, the car phone installation. That was built into the vehicle. Then you've got the transportable, which was capable of being carried, um, if you had strong arms, of course. And then you start seeing the hand portable emerge. We tend to think of today's mobile phone that it was always a handheld device like we have today. It wasn't. The transportable and the car phone were the dominant two handsets of those early years of the mobile phone, not only in the UK, but in all other countries too. 
the hand portable emerges and of course that has demands on coverage and network design to make all of that work. So the handset has evolved significantly and had it not there's a big question whether we would have had the sort of coverage that we now have and enjoy. So this event today we're celebrating obviously the technology, the engineering, advances that are made in the networks and the networks design and also of course how that's translated into product, the mobile phones themselves. Because if the product isn't attractive to the customer, the customers don't follow and then we don't have the service. So we're trying to capture the whole story here today looking at handsets and networks and technologies. So it all started 30 years ago with Michael Harrison making that phone call in the early hours of 1985 to his father, Sir Ernest. And look at where we've come now. Thank you.